as Somalis depending on remittances from abroad have received a temporary reprieve after Barclays agreed to continue operating remittance accounts for another 15 days. The bank had given Monday, September 30th, as the last day that it would operate the accounts, but Dahab Shield and the Somalia Money Services Association went to court to protest the move. The case will be heard on October 15th, and Barclays will provide these services until then. Many Somalis depend on money sent back from relatives abroad for their livelihood, but Barclays Barclays is expected to shut the remittance accounts in compliance with international regulations, particularly from the U.S. However, three remittance companies have had their accounts closed. And staying with the story, Dr. Lori, Laura Hammond, a senior lecturer at London School of Oriental Studies, says that it is essential for the British government to take action first so as to avoid strained relations between the U.K. government and British Somalis going forward. For so many reasons, it has the power to sort of pull apart the relationship between the British government and the Somali community. If the government doesn't take a strong leadership position, um, then Somalis wonder, well, are you really in favor of our interests? Are you really looking after our interests or not? Because if it doesn't matter to you whether we can send money to our relatives, knowing that that's what's keeping the country aflo afloat, then what is the rest of your development intervention, humanitarian intervention, state building support really all about? Because for us, this is the most important thing. They can't, they can't tell a, a bank like Barclays, you must do business with X, but they can certainly say, we're going to re-examine the regulatory system and create safeguards to protect banks who want to work with Somali money transfer companies. In Somalia, the possibility of a closure to the remittance accounts remains a huge concern as users do not have an alternative remittance service. Here are some of their views. Such closure would have serious consequences. Somalia has been dependent on remittances for over two decades. Most families depend on money from their kin abroad. I think we should be treated differently. The economy of this country is dependent on the Somali diaspora community. Closure of these accounts would not only be a big blow to us, but also translate to present-day colonialism, where some powers can close our accounts at will. I think the world should intervene. Now for more on the fate of the Dahab Shil accounts and what this latest action means for those in Africa whose lives are dependent on remittances, we're now joined by Natalie Fier Fieri live from London. Mohammed Hirmoge is joining us from Mogadishu. Natalie, let me begin with you. What is the latest? Is Barclays going to make good on its threat to close these Dahab Shil accounts? Well, of course, there is this court case that uh, we just heard about that's going to now happen uh, on the 15th of October. The High Court uh, will be hearing this, uh, this application for a temporary injunction by Dahab Shil. In fact, that uh, hearing was due to take place today, but Barclays suggested uh, this take place in two weeks because two other money transfer companies that are not Somali have also uh, applied for an injunction because they are also facing closure. So Barclays suggested that in two weeks' time, it would be best that all these hearings take place and so that all sides could prepare. Uh, and it looks like unless something in terms of an agreement is reached before then, which is very unlikely, then we could see it being in the hands of the court uh, whether Barclays continues with its decision after two weeks to close these accounts or whether they will remain open. All right, Mohammed, coming to you there in Mogadishu, obviously one of the most affected places in the world by this development. What are the reactions there after this development? Penina, Somalis from all walks of life are quite unhappy about this impending closure of Barclays. Uh, they are somehow quite apprehensive that this might not end well. Uh, but most of them believe that 40% of families back home, back in Somalia, depend on this system. And according to the Central Bank of Somalia, 60%, I mean, uh, uh, the remittances make 60% of foreign exchange earnings in the country annually. But why Barclays and Dahab Shil? Dahab Shil because uh, Dahab Shil makes uh, a third, handles a third of all the remittances that come from abroad, and we understand 1.2 billion shillings annually 
come from abroad, from Somali king abroad uh, as a remittances to support families back home. Uh, therefore, are people quite apprehensive that this might have a bad ending and finally Jahab Shield might lose? Uh, and pe people know families will be grossly affected. All right, so Natalie, coming back to you, obviously a two-week window there, though a lot of people, especially in Mogadishu, are not quite optimistic about it. So what are authorities saying um, about the customers that use these money transfer services and also about the attendant cost of mainstream services? Well, there was a discussion held between government departments and stakeholders involved last Friday uh, when people hoped a solution would be reached. And the government has set up a working group to deal with the issue of Somali remittance companies. They acknowledge that it is a vital lifeline that is essential to the development of Somalia that, you know, this uh, remittances, the amount of money people send back is so much more than aid or other help or support that is given to Somalia. So they're saying that they are looking at solutions. They're working with money transfer companies, with the British Bankers Association, and they're looking at the possibility of setting up a safe corridor so that people can send money to Somalia because, of course, they do acknowledge that there is not a banking system in Somalia. So unlike many other countries that do use money transfer services, uh, in Somalia there really is no other option apart from companies like Dahab Shil and other Somali money transfer companies that have now already had their accounts closed down. All right, so Mugge, let's pick it up from what uh, from where Natalie has left it, that there are no banking services there in, in Somalia. Obviously, we're talking about mainstream services such as MoneyGram and Western Union, which are being touted as possible replacements to Dahab Shil. Are they accessible there in Mogadishu? No, both MoneyGram and uh, Western Union money transfer uh, systems are not available in Mogadishu, uh, partly because people here never thought uh, they will need an alternative uh, to the very effective hawala system, that, uh, the informal hawala system that is available in every other village and hamlet in Somalia. But even though both MoneyGram and Western Union money transfer are to be available or to reach Mogadishu, for example, they will need to meet logistics costs as well as outsource because they will only have to hire locals because they cannot uh, bring over foreigners over here to do the job that will involve some security risks. Uh, besides, uh, people here don't believe that MoneyGram and Western Union money transfer could anyway replace the informal hawala system. We understand how the hawala systems operated. They were quite informal and all it needed was uh, somebody abroad will just have to, to deposit money in one of the hawala outlets abroad and within hours it's credited in every other remote corner of this country. Uh, for, uh, people think uh, both MoneyGram and, and uh, the uh, Western Union money transfer will not be as effective. Now, Natalie, coming back to you, Dahab Shil says that it will do anything that it is required to do. Uh, but seriously speaking, how much really can it be able to do within this two-week deadline? Well, of course, in two weeks, there's not that much it can do. Abdul Rashid Duale, the chief executive of Dahab Shil, did issue a statement today uh, in which he reiterated his commitment to work with Barclays, to work with the government and other money remittance companies to come up with a solution if there's uh, new requirements from Barclays that they will comply with them because, of course, Barclays hasn't stipulated any new guidelines uh, that remittance companies should follow. That is one of the problems. Uh, but he is also asking for a 12-month extension so that there can be change, so that there can be improvements to the system. But he said, and Dahab Shil has said, that what is really needed for this to happen is a major overhaul of the financial system in Somalia. You know, we were just talking about the fact that there is no banking system. Uh, and two weeks, of course, is not that much time at all. And he has reiterated the need for a 12-month extension by Barclays uh, to keep uh, Dahab Shil's accounts open while alternatives are reached, whether this is with the government or with Barclays or uh, another alternative banking method. All right, let's leave it there for now. Natalie Fiori live in London, Mohamed Hirmoge in Mogadishu. Thank you both for joining us. Now, turning down south to South Africa, where the elite anti corruption police in it has said that it is investigating possible graft in a $210 million black empowerment transaction at Goldfields. The investigation follows a 2010 deal that saw Goldfields hand a 9% stake in its South Deep mine to a group of black investors in line with the country's black economic empowerment program. However, 
the deal only benefited ANC's chairwoman, Beleka Mbete, and relatives of anti-apartheid heroes, including Nelson Mandela. The investigation comes on the heels of a similar probe by the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission into the dual-listed Johannesburg-based bullion producer. The ANC's black economic empowerment push is often criticized as benefiting only a narrow politically connected elite, but few of these scandals result in prosecution. And staying in South Africa, the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, AMCU, remained on strike at Anglo Platinum's Tambalani Mine near Rustenburg. The workers warned the company to reverse a decision to retrench more than 3,000 miners. And as CCTV's Angela Coppola now reports, Amplat has been at pains to explain why it needs to retrench some workers. Striking AMCU miners congregated on an open field near the entrance to the Tembalani mine to hear their leadership tell them that the first meeting with Anglo Platinum management didn't go according to plan. Honestly, I don't trust them concerning the meeting we, we held, but they were very much arrogant. We don't know this time they are going to, to, to respond in a good manner, but if only they are going to respond in a good manner, we are going to respond in a good manner because we don't like strikes because we know that they are affecting our economy. It appears that AMCO are a little uncomfortable about Anglo Platinum management and AMCO appears to have a mandate from its members that if the retrenchments aren't taken off the table, union members will continue to strike. But that's not the only issue. We, we listed there, I mean, about 23 things that we wanted, but only three things, uh, they, they respond positively. But the, tw the rest of the 20, they couldn't respond uh, positively. But at the end of the day, we managed to say, OK, whatever you do, we as AMCO, we're saying no to retrenchment. You can come up with other plans, but zero uh, tolerance when it comes to retrenchment. AMCO leadership earlier told their amassed congregation here that they would be reporting back to them after a meeting with the Anglo management. What is clear is that they're not going to budge on the retrenchments. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV at Tembalani Mine outside Rustenburg. All right, let's now discuss this issue further with Sumitra Naidu. She is live for us from Johannesburg. Good to see you, Sumitra. So obviously Monday's meeting did not bear any fruit. I'm co-workers proceeding with the industrial action. What, what solutions are they proposing? Well, Panina, as I understand, there's still some meetings going on uh, this evening. So, so far, there's been uh, no resolution. Uh, there's been no word or, uh, from either AMCO or Amplas as yet. So, we're not really sure what AMCO is, is, is demanding, other than the fact that they don't want these retrenchments to go through. AMCO said this afternoon it will continue with its protest action tomorrow. The union said it will meet again at the Tembalani mine to report back to its members about uh, the meeting. In the meantime... AMCO is insisting that Amplas must stop its planned job cuts of some 3,000 mine workers at its mining operations in Rustenburg. The last we heard, well, those, uh, you know, the members of AMCO were protesting outside that mine today. And the last we heard from AMCO was that it was called back to Johannesburg for a meeting. So hopefully uh, there can be some sort of compromise at that meeting. We're still waiting word from that. So, Sumitra, approximately how much are we looking at in terms of losses due to this strike? Sumitra, did you get me? All right, seems, seems we have lost uh, Sumitra that she can't really be able to get us here in studio. But that's Sumitra Naidu telling us about this AMCO, uh, AMCO strike going on there in Johannesburg. You're watching Bees Africa. Let's take a break coming up. Ugandan farmers are switching from crops like maize to sorghum as new demand rises from makers of beer.
This is Asia. Asia means business. Welcome back to Biz Africa. China's largest hydropower project in Nigeria, Zungeru, has now been activated. Representatives from China and Nigeria signed a preferential buyer credit loan agreement on Saturday, paving way for the construction that is to take five years. Once completed, the hydropower station will be Nigeria's second largest in capacity and will relieve the electricity shortage nationwide. Present at the signing ceremony are Nigeria's Federal Minister of Finance, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, and China's Ambassador to Nigeria, Deng Po Ching. Participants also include officials with the Nigerian Ministry of Power. The agreement was reached by the two governments during President Goodluck Jonathan's visit to China in July. The contract for the construction has been awarded to a consortium of two Chinese contractors, China National Electric and Engineering Corporation, CNEEC and Sino Hydro. And I want to congratulate the two companies and tell them that much is expected of them in terms of performance, quality, and speed. The total cost of the project adds up to about $1.3 billion, 75% of which is to be loaned by China's Export Import Bank. The loan is for 20 years with an annual interest rate of 2.5%. The professional loan for this project is the biggest one that ever given to a single project in Nigeria by China. Nigeria, which is the second largest economy in Africa, stands at just 4,500 megawatts in electricity capacity, a figure that cannot meet even the basic needs for a country with 7% rate in economic growth. The Zungeru hydropower station, which is to be finished by the year 2018, will provide a capacity of 700 megawatts. However, questions are being raised about the high cost in Zungeru. Here's what the Ministry of Power has to say. There are some dams that the newspaper recently referred to, some dams in, in other countries, in Ethiopia, in China, in Brazil. These are dams on a gorge. These gorges are the best places where you can view dams. And uh, Zungeri is not on a gorge, it's just on a running flat uh, area on the Kaduna River. So all those factors come to play. So on dams that are on similar terrain, Zungeri is the lowest. The Zungeri station has been positioned about 150 kilometers away from Abuja on the river Niger in Niger State. An idea conceived almost 30 years ago, the project bears the hope of the nation. Peter Okaba, CCTV. Ugandan farmers are increasingly turning to sorghum to tap into a growing demand for the crop from beer makers. One Ugandan beer brand brewed from sorghum is rapidly gaining market share. The farmers are now hoping it will bring steady prices and a whole new market. CCTV's Isabel Nakiria has more on that story. This slash green garden of sorghum has been Samuel Adimo's source of income for years now. He doesn't regret switching from crops like maize to sorghum because he sees stable prices and his stock being bought by breweries. And with a family of 17 members, Samuel Adimo's over 10 acres of sorghum make him a comfortable man. We benefited a lot when we were from a growing of this apple fruit. We benefited. I was living in a such house, but now you can get me in a Mabati house. <laughs> that one is, I call it, is an achievement because of all this apple growing. Sorghum was until the 1990s one of the staple crops in Uganda until brewers identified it as a raw material for beer. We chose sorghum because sorghum was really available. It is a natural crop uh, in Uganda and therefore it could be adapted much more easily. Research and trials were also carried out in eastern Uganda where Edimu does his sorghum farming, was chosen as one of the best regions in the country with a suitable climate. Several farmers are turning to growing the crop. The breweries now buy over 8,000 tons of sorghum each year from farmers. They, they promoted this cotton. They said that cotton is serious, but in the long run, Cotton failed. Even farmers now who used to go to join the, the growing of uh, cotton have now 
come back to, a, to, to grow again in April Pool. Beer brewers say the Eagle Beer, the brand made from sorghum, is now one of the biggest selling beers in Africa because it's affordable. Government uh, saw the importance of having a local raw material. At that time there was um, uh, the pro uh, poverty eradication plan. So under that plan, the government uh, said, okay, we are going to reduce taxes, excise duty on, on, on the on ego, as long as you brew with the local raw materials. Breweries have also started using other local raw materials like maize and barley and hope to use only locally sourced cereals, 100% for making their beer in Uganda. With the production of sorghum brewed beer increasing each year, the demand for local raw materials is also expected to grow. And Ugandan beer makers are urging the government to support farmers financially so they can meet this demand. Isabel Nakiria, CCTV, Ginger, Eastern Uganda. Nigeria is reeling from details of a report that exposed how much the country loses annually from oil theft. The report by London's Chatham House indicated that the country loses in excess of 5% of its production to unscrupulous dealers. CCTV's correspondent Natalie Fieri met with the author and now reports about the vice that is plaguing Nigeria's economy and oil producers alike. Oil theft in Nigeria is believed to be so rampant that in the first three months of this year alone, at least 100,000 barrels of oil are believed to have gone missing, the equivalent to 5% of the country's output, according to a report released by the London-based think tank Chatham House. The report aims to put the extent of the thefts on the radar of international governments. Then people will be more alert to potential signs. But it will also foster more of a willingness to deal with the problem. At the moment, I think a lot of people have got their heads in the sand. But major challenges to tracking illegal oil flows exist. Corruption and fraud are rampant in the country's oil sector. So the lines between legal and illegal supplies of Nigerian oil can be blurry, say the authors. The report is the first independent investigation into the international dimension of Nigerian oil theft. It warns that if the problem is left to escalate, it could pose serious reputational risks for financial centres like the UK, where oil thieves are believed to be laundering the proceeds. So recommendations for international governments include putting suspected oil thieves on do not trade lists, freezing their assets and looking out for oil theft links in anti-money laundering cases. Others add that how the industry in Nigeria is controlled must be addressed. The real action that needs to be taken is trying to look at how the, the, the entire system is regulated and how oil is leaving the country to try and tackle those businessmen and those individuals and indeed those politicians that have control and influence over that type of activity. Experts say that if left unchecked, the problem will continue to escalate and that the knock-on effect of the costs to major oil operators will be far-reaching. The price that we pay for fuel on a daily basis um, is significantly impacted by this particular crime. You would argue that it could be a priority for, for, uh, for governments and banks to, um, to deal with it. The report adds that if governments address illegal flows of money from oil thefts, it will also have a positive impact on tackling and reducing other forms of international organised crime. Natalie Fury, CCTV, London. All right, let's have a look now at how the major bosses performed today. First day of trading this week, the Nigeria All Share Index ending the day in the green with slightly over three quarters of a percent. The JSE ending the day in the red with about uh, three quarters of a percent. Nairobi Securities Exchange in the green, slightly over half of a percent. And the EGX finally ending in the red with 0.83%. Thanks for watching, Biz Africa, which is back to you.